This old mine was abandoned over a century ago. At that time, researchers already knew that gold and quartz had precipitated from fluids. But the question was, how had this fluid formed in the first place? Some geologists believed that granite was involved, the magmatic theory. But we now know that the veins and the quartz are 50 to 80 million years older than the granite. So it can't be the granites. These days, most researchers have come around to the orogenic or metamorphic model. In this theory, the gold-bearing fluids were formed from hot rocks at great depths. When oceanic sedimentary rocks were deeply buried and metamorphosed to about 600 degrees Celsius, in conditions known as amphibolite fasces, some minerals released water. The immense amount of fluid given off fueled a natural gold factory. Tiny concentrations of gold that naturally occurred in the rocks were dissolved and carried upwards in a gold-laden fluid. When it reached the Greenschist fasces, where temperatures were between 3 and 400 degrees, the fluid precipitated quartz and gold in faults and fractures. If this theory is correct, we should find there is a large area of high-grade metamorphic rock beneath the gold field that is depleted in gold. So the irony is that to prove the theory, we're now looking for an absence of gold. And the expert in this is Dr Ian Pitcairn. Ian travels around the world collecting samples of both high and low grade metamorphic rocks, looking for levels of depletion or concentration of gold. And in this, he has found evidence to support the metamorphic model. I met up with Ian in Victoria at the old Wattle Gully gold mine. Well, the first thing I would talk about is that in some orogenic gold terrains, you don't actually see granites. Mm -hmm. uh, however, we do see the gold deposits, and um, that's been one of the first things, particularly in, in Otago in New Zealand, which has led people to suggest, well, if you don't see any granites, then how can the, the gold deposits be formed by these fluids? But the metamorphic model has come into vogue. So why do you think there has been a, a shift in ideas? What's the evidence? There's, there's certainly a, a set of characteristics which are um, observable in a number of different orogenic gold terrains um, which point towards a, a metamorphic fluid being the, the fluid which forms the, uh, these gold deposits. And firstly, uh, the composition of a, of a fluid that's released uh, during dehydration reactions in metamorphism, that's quite well known. We, quite, we understand that rather well from experimental work. Now by dehydration you mean liberation of water? Yeah, exactly. The liberation of water during the metamorphic process. And we see that the, the composition of fluids that we observe in, in veins such as this, they fit very, very well with what we know about the composition of, of a metamorphic fluid and how it's, uh, and what it what it should be composed of, basically water, a little bit of CO2 and some dissolved sulphur, H2S species. So uh, the experimental work and the observations of what we see in the veins, they fit together very well. The fluids that form veins were derived from deep level metamorphism, but vein deposition actually occurred at a much higher level where temperatures were lower. Almost every orogenic gold belt, be it whatever age, you know, from the Archean um, 2.7 billion years old or something that's formed in the last few million years, um, all of the gold deposits occur, or almost all of them occur, at what we would call green schist fasces. This is a, a grade of metamorphic uh, conditions, probably around 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. That would have been the temperature the rocks were heated to. That's the, the, the grade of, of conditions where we see all these deposits. Green schist rocks are easily exposed by erosion, so we know they have elevated gold. But a problem for Ian is that the assumed source of gold, the amphibolite fasces, often remains deeply buried. 
Fortunately, he found a place where a massive portion of the lower crust had conveniently made itself accessible in a most spectacular fashion. The, the rocks are very well exposed in New Zealand. On the west coast, uh, you have a, as a large fault line called the Alpine Fault, and we've had uplift on the Alpine Fault, which has caused the Southern Alps, so these the big mountain range on the west coast of, of New Zealand. Um, they're beautiful, it's a fantastic area to do field work, really great, but what it meant geologically was that the, the deep level um, metamorphic rocks from around 600 degrees temperature, representing very deep levels in the crust, they've been uplifted by this uplift on the fault and so these deep level rocks are exposed so we can actually sample what would have been at 25 kilometres depth in, in the crust. So on the flanks of this mountain range you see the lower grade rocks? The further away from the, the fault you actually get, the, the, the lower metamorphic grades are, are the rocks and eventually when you get f over towards the, uh, the east coast of New Zealand you're in rocks that haven't been metamorphosed at all, they're just uh, shales and grey wackies. So it's a perfect, we see full exposure of this complete crustal section from surface levels to uh, around 25 kilometres depth. From rocks that were unmetamorphosed to ones that were metamorphosed to 600 degrees Celsius so we can look at the rock at each metamorphic grade and compare the chemistry to try and see if there's been any um, systematic changes which might have um, caused formation of, of these deposits. So by collecting rocks from each metamorphic grade, Ian hoped to find some systematic changes in chemistry that would give a clue to the source area of the gold. I collected about 950 kilograms of rock <laughs> had it shipped back to Southampton where I was doing my PhD and analysed the rock for um, 60 different elements, major elements, trace elements, but specifically focusing on gold and silver and other elements which are, are often enriched in these gold deposits such as arsenic, antimony and, and mercury. And what I was looking for was, was rocks that might be depleted in gold, where the gold had been removed from the rock by a fluid, so that, that which would represent the source area. Ian's target area, the high-grade metamorphic rocks, were derived from oceanic sediments, which naturally contain low levels of gold. An average piece of rock would have, for example, one parts per billion, maybe two parts per billion gold in it. Um, so if we were looking for depletions on an element like gold, which is already low concentration, I needed a method that was maybe 10 parts per trillion uh, mm, that's detection remarkable. limit, so very low level. Ian used his ultra-sensitive method to analyse rocks from the whole range of metamorphic grades, looking for those rocks that were depleted in gold. Uh, and we found that the, the rocks from high metamorphic grade, so something around 500 to 600 degrees was the temperature that they'd been metamorphosed at, they were systematically depleted in gold and silver and arsenic and antimony, the same suite of elements that we see enriched in the deposits. Um, so these rocks, the high metamorphic grade rocks, um, represented the, the, or we think represented the source area for, for the deposits in, in New Zealand. And that's, that's what the metamorphic model suggests, is that you have this leaching of this large area of source rock. The metamorphic model can equally explain the origin of Victoria's gold deposits, whether large or small. Nature's own gold factory leached the precious metal from high-grade metamorphic rocks at depth. The gold-bearing fluids rose to higher levels to form the deposits we see today. This is the essence of the metamorphic model and the basis for the orogenic deposit type.